Thank you all again so much for having us. Thank you, Cindy, for hosting us. Thank you, Del Mar College, everybody. I'm so glad. I hope some people are watching. And if you, if you are, um, write a lot of really nice comments about how we look. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm so interested to see uh, like the different kinds of questions. And I actually have some questions for you all. And hopefully, we can, have, we can make this a learning process for both of us. Because we, even today, we're just talking about how much music can connect us and how much we have to learn from each other. And really, making music together and collaborating is what all of this is about. And then learning from each other, continuously learning uh, new repertoire, figuring out what you both like, what you both really are passionate about, and then trying to create those things together is, uh, is, is fun. And I hope that this turns into one of those learning experiences. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to introduce myself again. I'm David Portillo. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. I'm really, uh, I, I grew up in South Texas, and I'm super proud to be a Texan, super proud to be half Mexican and uh, half American. And uh, I am very, um, I, I, I feel like now in my, now I'm almost 40 years old, and I've done a lot of young artist programs, and I, I've sung uh, in a lot of great places. And I think one of my favorite things is to come home and get to collaborate with one of my favorite people ever, Kristen Roach. I'm so, so grateful that you Oh, it's just so much fun for me, too. I, I'm also a native San Antonian. And this, uh, the last time I was in this building was almost 20 years ago. I did a recital here with a former professor of music here. And uh, so it's really great to be back. And I'm so excited to see the new building on this campus. And congratulations to all of you. And thank you so much to all the people who work behind the scenes, whether that's a donor or a planner or the hardworking faculty. Um, most of my career has been either at the piano or on the podium or at the university. I taught at the University of Texas at San Antonio, at Texas State University, and now I just after almost 50 years in Texas, moved to Appleton, Wisconsin, and I teach at Lawrence University now. So I say all of that to also know that a program like this and a campus like this takes a lot of work. And we are so grateful to be, get to be even a small part of what you all are doing here. And we're very excited. Um, I think if we, if we would like to start with the questions, I, let's, let's go for it. Are there any that are that are already ready to have a question? Yes, and I think is this microphone for questions? Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's like a town hall political thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah come on up. That's a good question. Um, I still, at this age, don't know if voice is something. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I definitely loved to sing in choir. I loved to sing in, at church. I loved to sing with my friends. And um, I, so being in choir just it was that natural sort of progression into I'm going to get my undergrad in music education. And then I did, when I finished my student teaching, I started studying with a teacher up at North Texas. And he was like, you need to do a vocal performance degree. And I said, I don't know if you can get a job with that. But then I uh, was really excited about singing solos. And I had some stuff with some choral things. And I was very um, I was excited to actually go and get this degree. And I think about when I was in my master's, when I started doing some auditioning for young artist programs and singing arias kind of at a regular, t at a regular uh, on a regular basis, that I was like, um, I became motivated that I loved the repertoire and I loved being on stage and putting on costumes and making characters and um, I wanted to do that uh, a lot and then so I just kind of kind of moved on from there um, and of course there are some times that were really hard and I had to be re-energized about whether or not I wanted to do this um, but I think that that's a normal progression that I had to kind of like constantly be encouraged uh, by a lot of times it was um, encouraged by a really great opportunity, a really great uh, role that I was a part of, a really great group of people in a cast, um, really great collaborators. So we, we, have, we get to have some fun making some music. Um, so yeah, I would say when I was finishing undergrad, getting into my master program, master's program, I became to um, start self-encouraging um, self for the next steps. 
that about right? Well, it's your life, hon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love what you said just now about being re-energized, and we were just talking on the drive down about how important opportunities like this are who have been in this career for a while, that our artistry continues to evolve and change. And I think the first time that David and I performed together was 2002. I was the chorus master for the Lyric Opera of San Antonio, and David was in the chorus and sang a solo role in La Boheme, the little guy who steps forward and he says two lines, and, and now look what happened. Um, but the, as, the, as time passes and we all change as people, the opportunity to then reinvent yourself as an artist is really important. So invitations like this, vital. Because then we get to have the opportunity to say, well, what is it that we want to sing there? And what is it that we'd like to do together? And we, we've done a couple of other types of concerts together. And so, you know, having a longer musical relationship with someone is also really, really rewarding. And so I, I would encourage all of you to, to look around and, and look at the people that you really enjoy making music with now and just keep circling back around to them throughout your life. Because the, as, as you all that's going to be super rewarding. Yeah, and you have so many shared experiences that you're also going to continue to do. And I think that those shared experiences, as you get older, become shorter, and they you don't have as many of them as you become older. It's like when you get older, it's harder to like make friends fast. But it's really great when you have shared experiences from you know back in 2002, when I was five years old, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I was 12. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any question? Any other questions? Yes. Do, do you mind coming to the mic? Yeah, come on down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, um, what are your favorite pieces of music to perform? What are my favorite pieces to perform? And I, this is one of my two questions. Okay, and then what's the second one? Um, and who inspired you to be a vocalist? Oh, wow. Well, a lot of people inspired me, and I think also some of my favorite music is, in, in that answer also inspired me. Um, some of my favorite music now is definitely some of the operas by Donizetti, Rossini, uh, some of those fun comic operas. I love L'Elysir d'Amore, it's the elixir of love. I love uh, The Barber of Seville. Um, I think the perfect opera is actually The Marriage of Figaro. It's a Mozart opera, and there's not a great tenor role necessarily, but it's my favorite opera. So, um, because it, I think it tells the story perfectly through music, and the music is so gorgeous and emotionally, it hits you really hard. Um, and then the people, my mother, number one, definitely, because uh, she has still one of the most beautiful voices I can ever have heard. And she's the one who, who really kind of encouraged all the growing up music that we did. She taught at a seminary in San Antonio, and so I was always in a choir rehearsal that she was in and she was running. And then I was also always like sitting and bothering her at a piano lesson that she was <laughs> giving. And I think all of that encouragement, actually just being around music that much is so, uh, that's invaluable. And then, um, you know, going on from there, I had wonderful choir directors that I looked up to, Dr. John Salantian at UTSA, Dr. Gary Mabry, I have Kristen Roach, I have Dottie Randall in San Antonio, um, who I worked with after college. And then, of course, you know, all the, some, I, I feel like it would be name droppy, but there's lots of amazing conductors and collaborators that I feel like I've worked with, and I'm so, like, I, there, there's so many to name. And then, then you have your friends who are all singers. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot. But I have to say that the, the, the ones that are early on are still really important musicians that I really looked up to and I still look toward. And the fact that I can make music with one of them from my earliest days is just like, that's there is, again, invaluable. And I still get to sing Christmas carols with my mom sometimes, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you as far as the... I love that you talked about your mother because actually my first musical memories are sitting on my mother's lap. She was the church organist and I would put my hands on top of hers while she practiced or I would climb up on the piano and then try to play something myself. Um, and, and, you know, obviously my parents were big encouragements of me early on. I also had some wonderful early piano teachers, um, Dr. Janice K. Hodges at UTSA and then um, Antonelle Fernando Laris and Jean Barr at the Eastman School 
all really helped solidify my skills and my love of the piano. And I still, even though I have done a lot of other kinds of things in my musical life, I still think the piano is my primary musical voice. And I, I feel the most at home when I'm playing and somebody is singing beautifully, whether that's through their body or through you know a, another instrument. And, um, and now I'm also incredibly inspired by my students. And you know, when I can look and say, oh, I have a form, sorry about that. When I have a former piano student who is now playing in the orchestra for the sh uh, Chicago that's on Broadway and it's been on tour, or you know, I, David and I met in 2002 and, you know, and I've been able to follow his career or some of the other um, important opera singers who've come through San Antonio, Rene Barbera, Rafael Moras, uh, Dana Beth Miller, and these are all, they're not necessarily people who, that I would call my students, but they're all people that I got to work with at a particular time in their life. And um, that, that's also super rewarding. And, and they, when I see the people that have gotten to just pass through my musical life, and then I find them through social media or wherever it is that they're doing, you know, there's just, there's just that little glint that's like, oh, right, that was such a great time that we got to have together. Um, Dave and I were just having dinner last night with another colleague in San Antonio and sharing stories. Some that, of memories that the three of us had made together and others of, of you know, places where each of us had been individually. And those kinds of, um, that, that also really fuels you, keeps you going as mm -hmm. an artist. I forgot to mention my voice teachers. I mean, as singers, are, we, are you all singers in here? Yes, okay, excellent. So uh, there, if, if you're taking private voice, it's actually a very, um, it's, it's one of those experiences that is super personal because you're singing and you're working on your craft, and then you have one person who is really kind of guiding that as well. Um, Ms. Linda Pechke is still teaching in San Antonio, but she was at UT, UT San Antonio, and I took with her, and she's amazing, and also such a great spirit to, to help young singers and help so many young singers move along. And then uh, my next voice teacher that I was in Texas was Dr. Cody Garner, and he lives in Texas, uh, back in Texas again, and so I get to see him every once in a while. And I still study, uh, w when possible, with Dr. Stephen King, who's at, who was at Rice University, and now he's just freelancing. Um, all of, I mean, I, I, and I still also work with a friend, Jason Ferrante, on Zoom when we get a chance and sing for each other. So technically, I'm always looking into finding my voice teacher. We kind of get, build a team of people who you constantly work with in order to, to help things out. If I'm learning roles, I'm really lucky that I, where I live in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, um, I have a, a couple of coach friends who are who can coach roles that I can help that will help me learn the roles. But then also I can uh, you know just run through repertoire with them if I need to. If say I'm doing a recital in a couple of weeks and I'd like to just run some things, so I have a really like nice team of people around. And of course, that's how Chris and I first met was because I think I was just singing some arias for you in the beginning and. Um, you know, I, I now feel like she's part of my team, and we're also a collaboration, so it's, it's very exciting. I, I love that word team because, uh, and all of us have teams, right? And I, I'm always amazed by the, the people that I'm really grateful for in my life at any given moment, but also when you notice there's a part of your life that maybe isn't going the way that you want it to go, and you're like, what do I do here? And probably the reason it isn't going so well is because you need some help. You need to reach out to somebody, and the I, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of you know whether that's an accountant to help me with my taxes, or a lawyer to help me drop some papers, or you know a, a counselor to help me process some deep emotional event, or a, a priest who has really helped me connect to my spiritual life, or something you know. But building that team of relationships is is so important and also really rewarding. So I'm, I'm glad to have you on my team too, friend. Yay. Yeah. Build a team. That's yeah. next. I have a question for one for each of you. Uh, for you, uh, sorry, it's a little. Um, what are some other instruments that you've kind of thought about, kind of going into more of a professional space with, and but you know, of course, besides uh, piano. And then uh, for you. Uh, how do you think your voice has changed as you've gone on in your career from when you were younger to now? Good question. I'm so glad you asked about other instruments because it's so important as a musician that we are versatile. And whether that is 
I, I love that you said bringing into the professional space because honestly, there are a lot of things that I've dabbled in yeah. as a musician that no one but me has any business knowing about. <laughs> um, so I would encourage all of you, like sing in the shower, do, do all those other, with whatever other instrument. Um, all of my cousins played guitar and I, I don't, but I did learn to recognize some of the grip so that I could play country songs with them. I did play in a country show at, um, Fiesta, uh, sorry, at SeaWorld one summer, so I played and sang back up in a country band. I've also played polka band. Um, so I, all the German and Czech polkas, um, which is also my family's heritage, so that was super rewarding. David's like, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. The SeaWorld thing, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> when I was in school, I played flute for seven years, and I actually did that fairly seriously. I made Allstate two years, and then I got to college, and I heard what flutists who had 20,000 instruments and practiced the flute as many hours as I practiced the piano. Like, that, oh, that's what the flute's supposed to sound like. So I left that behind. Um, I've also um, done a fair amount of singing myself, um, working for the Episcopal Church in particular. When my, I, I have two children, and when they were small, I had a job at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in San Antonio, and before that, the Church of Reconciliation. And both of those places allowed me to develop my own singing as a choral singer, which was wonderful. And, and when I was at St. Mark's, I was in charge of the children's music program, and my choir sang every Sunday morning. And so I, I also then learned to sing high notes because it was an Episcopal church and we sang descants all the time. Um, I also got to teach my own children to read music and sing and to use their faith in a, a worship setting in combination with music. So that was also super rewarding. I did some arranging as well with the Episcopal Church, and I have a CD of jazz tunes. I mean, like all kinds of random things that um, the phone rang and someone was like, hey, you want to do this? And I said yes. But my favorite thing to do has always been opera and music of the theater and music for the voice. So that now that is mostly what I focus on. But yeah, there's always these sort of, um, I also started learning to play the violin during COVID, which was super important for my sanity. <laughs> and um, it, and also an instrument that's a part of the orchestra that I'd never been a part of before. So I got, um, I, I'm in Suzuki Book 3. Nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, those are fun. Well, so, all right, David, yeah, talk so about your voice. I think the same, the same thing kind of applies. I feel like I, you have to be versatile when you're young and you're a student and one, you also need to make some money. So I was singing in all the church jobs. I was trying to get all the solo gigs. And I definitely was, I was a choral musician, like through and through for a very long time. And um, then when you start working on, on opera mainly, um, a lot of things that you do in the choral classroom or in the choir room have to change when you get up on stage. And really what happened was I, um, like, it was harder to sing choral music when I was doing more opera stuff. So um, when I, I, I still had church jobs every Sunday pretty much until I was into my 30s. But I really, uh, I miss that now, but I definitely know that it would have been a very big turnaround and, um, and vocally I would have had to, like, you know, you have to do different things if you want to blend with everybody. Um, so I, I feel like as far as the, my voice, the way it's changed, um, definitely there's some size differences that happens. There's a little, it's a little louder, it's a little rounder. And then of course, um, the, when I started doing certain types of repertoire um, that require maybe, um, there's, I used to sing a lot more Rossini and, and fast handle coloratura, and now maybe I sing less Rossini and I sing more Mozart and I sing uh, some of the slower, slower tempi for handle stuff. And so like it really, I think your voice as it matures will do some natural things. And the idea is to make sure that your voice stays fresh, light, and as, um, as uh, I guess as easy as possible. And I, I definitely know that when, I, when things feel hard, that's when I have to back up and say, okay, let me go back to this repertoire that felt easy at one time and work it back into to, um, to that, uh, to that same sensation, that same feeling. Um, but I think in the beginning, it's be as versatile as possible, get all your musicianship skills down, learn a lot of languages, and then really, then you can really kind of hone into exactly what your voice is gonna do. And, um, and let the voice be as easy as possible. And let that, that will kind of show exactly the way your voice will grow. Yeah. I, I think the, the versatility conversation is really important because the, both David and I do a lot of newer music. And whether it's actually world premieres, which we've both done, or just music that is 
only a few months or a few years old. One of the things particularly in this country that's happening with writing is a synthesis of a bunch of different musical styles. And so, for example, the last opera performance I saw was a new piece at the Metropolitan Opera that was at the movies. And that piece is a synthesis of Puccini and Poulenc, and the composer was in a, like a nouveau art rock band when, when he was in high school. And so there's this sort of rhythmic component. And so the familiarity with a bunch of different styles of music, also whether that's music that is absolutely scripted in the way that it's written down, or sort of sketched out with the opportunity to improvise, or if it's completely an aural, oral tradition. Um, I mean, the, the ability to be a musician in all of those settings not just increases your employability, but also increases your enjoyment yeah. of what you're doing and the opportunity to collaborate and the types of people that, that you'll get to work with. Um, and the, really, a lot of the new works, those projects are sometimes the most fulfilling, and you will get so much out of them. They're, way, they're very, it's a lot of work, and you have to start learning them early. Sometimes, you know, you're, it's frustrating because it's hard music to learn, but it's actually very, very fulfilling. This last summer, I just did John Corleano uh, he, he wrote a new opera called The Lord of Cries, and I was playing a crazy person, and um, straight jacket and everything, and there was, uh, basically, it just said shriek, and it just had an X at the top of the staff, and it said shriek for eight beats, and it was like a triple forte at the end, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> you know, how do I learn how to do this? And so I like worked with a, uh, an acting voice coach to learn how to shriek, and then I had to breathe and immediately sing this B flat on an uval and like all of these things that you don't think in the moment, oh, this is gonna be fulfilling. This is only gonna like tear my voice up. I'm gonna be so frustrated. But really, the experience of learning exactly what to do physically and then objectively and then on stage, you get to just inhabit this, this character once you actually have the frame of what to do. It's super fulfilling. And how cool is it to make an opera or make a piece of music the with first, the yeah. composer right there in the room. You know, we don't get to call up Mozart and Handel and say, what does this mean? Yeah. You know, but you can turn to the team of creators and then in a new piece and, and have this conversation about, well, what, what is that? What does it mean? What did you want there? Am I, am I doing, does it sound it the way you thought right. it was gonna sound? Yeah. And, yeah. It's very fulfilling. What else? Yeah, any other questions? I was wondering, um, like, how, going back a little bit, how important it is to, I guess, know people or, like, have connections and make connections, whether it be friends or, like, just people you know in this, in this field in general, like. It's everything. It is everything. People are everything. Yeah. I mean, as much as we do, and you all are doing this right now, uh, so much work is in the practice room by yourself and it feels very isolated, it feels really personal, it feels really like, um, you, you know, it feels a little uh, isolated in solitude, but it's all about connecting with people. It's about learning how to tell stories, it's about learning how to inhabit something, a sound, a, an emotion that you, can, you wanna give to people. And uh, I know this sounds super hippy-dippy, but it's actually like the, the best way that you're going to you're going to feel fulfillment with music is if you learn to really enjoy the connections with your colleagues, with the people who are standing next to you in choir, with your, with your teachers that you're working with, whether it's your private instrument teachers or it's the, the, the coaches that you're working with, a conductor. These are, those sorts of relationships are the kind of connections that you're going to remember uh, as, you, as you continue to go on. Well, and, and whatever your plan is after the program you're enrolled in here, whatever next step you take will require recommendations. And it will, at a certain point, it will cease to be the recommendations of your teachers, and it will start to be the recommendations of your peers. And I know my own goal for my own teaching is to try to train up an artist that I would be proud to sit next to on a future faculty. And at a certain point that I would look across and now, you know, we started off as not quite teacher and student, but uh, you know, conductor and yeah. conductor and chorus member. And you know, now we, we see each other as colleagues. And um, 
I also can count on the fingers of one hand, and I'll be 50 next year, the, the number of jobs I have gotten specifically from either a set of paperwork or a cold audition, somebody looked at a video of me playing or conducting. Every other musical opportunity I have ever had has been someone saying, oh, call Kristen, she's great at that. Or call Kristen, she's amazing, like she'd be the perfect member of your team. And so the, you know, there's so many talented people and the, your talent will get you in a door once, but getting back in that same door or moving on to whatever the next door is all about what people think of you. And so if you're surrounding yourself by people that inspire you and you're inspiring them, that um, synergy is then going to generate so many more incredible opportunities for you. And if you find yourself in a situation where you aren't inspired or you feel like you're just with the wrong group of people, say thank you very much and, and exit and find, you find your true pond. Um, and that they'll, be, they'll be glad too because they're probably also feeling like this is not a good fit. Right. And, and there will be then an opportunity that you're vacating for someone who will be perfect and you'll be moving on to whatever the, the perfect thing is for you. And as singers, we talk a lot about auditions and like, oh, what, what exactly are people looking, looking for? Um, what is the repertoire that, that they want to hear? What is it that I have to show? Really, the, the biggest thing to do is for you to be as prepared and comfortable as possible to show you, because that's what people really want, is to, for you to be genuine, for you to, to give, and then that's actually really what, um, what people are looking for in auditions. Then once you get that job, then that's the, that's the real work, is the actual, like, give yourself, uh, be, be nice, be a good colleague, um, enjoy the time that you have there because not everybody gets to make music. So while you're making music, don't complain about it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that I had to learn the wrong, the hard way too, you know. And I didn't have a great attitude all the time, but I definitely know now that when I do have an opportunity to to be making music, I you know I got to be as gracious as possible. And at times it's maybe not like the best situations, but there's always you there's always joy to find in creating and making music together. That's such a great phrase, joy to find. Because if we're really involved in something, it often is incredibly hard work. It's exhausting. Um, and, and it may not be performance ready every day, right? You know, how many, how many times do you go into the practice room and it just is not a good day? And you do the best that you can, but imagine what would happen if you hadn't shown up. And the same thing is true with your personal relationships. So, you know, make those phone calls. We were both talking on the way down here about how important it is for us now to stay in touch with our families because we don't live in the same town that they do. And so, you know, making those phone calls, sending those pictures and text messages. Um, and also then, you know, reaching out to people that you want to invite into your life, whether that's, you know, asking for an opportunity to collaborate together or asking for that audition or going to a performance of an ensemble that you, you want to be associated with at some point in the future. Um, Even today, I think this is kind of preaching to the choir because you all are here, but I know that there's a lot of people who I, I think that this, this shows that you all really care that you just show up. And I think Dr. Mabry is in San Antonio, he's the one who always says, the first step is to show up. And whether that is to watch your friend's recital when they ask you for feedback about what you think, whether it is to actually show up for a, a choral uh, concert that you, that you have a friend who's singing in, those are actual things that are kind of easy for us to do. But as, as you move on, they're really important to the other people who are around you. And it's really important to be, to be there because you don't know who also is going to be there, who you're going to get to either meet who you're going to get to become friends with. So this is, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I ran an opera company in San Antonio for seven years, and there were definitely artists that we engaged in, in leading roles who we could have hired any number of absolutely qualified, talented, fantastic people to collaborate with. But we also thought about and I, I'm stealing this from Joey Makovich, who is a fantastic opera conductor, and, and his phrase was always, I want to invite people in who are members of my family, because I am then going to be introducing these cast members 
to my board of directors, to my audience, to my orchestra. And in the case of opera, we're often rehearsing for weeks or months at a time, depending on what kind of project it is. And you, know, the, you, you wanna invite people that you wanna spend that amount of time with. And you also want to be the kind of person that someone wants to spend hours and really years making music with. That is a really good question because I, I, I think it ties into to everything, is making those connections is actually everything about making music together. Well, and didn't we all, I mean, I, we said we weren't gonna talk about the pandemic, but didn't we all feel the loss of it over the last two, year and a half? Like, like we, we take so much for granted about how easy it was to just like walk down the hallway and say, hey, and then move on. But you know, now we've all gotten much better at being intentional about those connections. And I, I, I really hope that everyone will remember how hard we had to work to stay in touch and still do it, even when we can now be in the same room. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of talk about the process of being a freelance performer so after, if, if, if you are interested in becoming a vocal performance major and then you want to continue going on, a lot of things kind of like, there, there's a lot of steps that happen and this isn't for everybody. I mean, obviously there's so many different experiences and ways that you get to these next levels of performance, but um, pretty much what happens is you do some schooling and then hopefully you do some auditions that are successful and then you have, there's either you have young artist programs and then you have, um, agents and um, I mean, what, what are the other ways? Or you just like self book some of your own opportunities. And really these projects, uh, when you get an opera role, a company will reach you as the performer and will ask you to be engaged from this date to this date. And sometimes the rehearsals are maybe just two weeks and then you have a week of performances. Sometimes they're four to five weeks and then you have two or three weeks of performances. It's different for every, every project. So um, that being said, you are kind of always around the same people for a really s a close amount of time. And, um, and that kind of relationship is very, um, some, sometimes it's like fast friends and you know, it's amazing. And then sometimes you're like, I'm doing this gig for 10 weeks in this foreign country and I don't know this language and it's, I'm a little sad and this is really hard. Um, but really, you end up knowing, uh, as you continue to do this, you end up knowing so many more of the same people, the world gets smaller and smaller and you begin to actually like enjoy like going to these new experiences and you get to travel around and do that sort of stuff too. Um, okay, why did I start all that? Anyway. Freelance artists. Freelance artists. So, um, and as freelance artists, you, um, you basically have to, like control all the other parts of your life. You don't have a boss to tell you when to show up and when to be ready for anything. It's a lot of your own self-management. And that kind of work sometimes works very well for some people. They are very self-motivated. They know exactly when they have to get deadlines done. And then some people, like me, there was a learning curve about making sure that I had to have all I had to have this role learned because the next role that I was going to have learned uh, have already um, had to practice while I was performing that one. These are all things that like you have to learn on the spot and it's such a blast and I can look back at it and say yay that was fun but in the time it's really scary <laughs> and it's actually very daunting but I, I wouldn't ask for any other job because it's been awesome. It's been such a blast. That you, you make an important point about self-management. And I think whatever, whatever your job ends up being, you know, whether you're in the, a public school teacher or you're a university teacher or you are leading a music program in a church or you are working in a job or a, a collection of jobs that aren't in music at all and then you're making music in the evenings or on the weekends or in the mornings before you go to work, uh, what, whatever your the, the structure of your life looks like, the ability to walk yourself back from a deadline, that, that is a universal life skill. The, the ability to say to yourself, this is what needs to happen today, and anything else is a bonus. Right. But if, if, if I get these two things done, and maybe it's 9 a.m. and they're already done, and then I have the rest of the day 
for myself. Or maybe it takes me until 11 p.m. because I procrastinated or because I am just really tired and I don't, there's something I don't want to do, but I am going to get it done. Like that ability, it's a very important life skill regardless. Yeah. Um, and we've but The other thing that I often do outside of my university work is work with professional singers who are in the process of learning m music that's new to them. So for example, Baritone X is going to be singing a new role and the rehearsals begin September 1st. But we are already meeting now because he wants to learn the music and then he wants to have some time to work with his voice teacher, make sure that it's all settled into his body well. Then we want to get back together, maybe say April, just check everything out. But, but then the entire summer, he's booked in a festival and he's singing a whole bunch of other music that has nothing to do with the stuff that we're going to work together. But September 1st, he's going to know that music because we had to work on it all the way back now. So I think that's also a little bit of what you were getting at yeah. about managing your calendar. Yeah. Um, I guess I can give it a personal example where I have two new roles back to back, one, in, one that's in May and then one that's in uh, July. And I know that I'm already nervous about it <laughs> because I know that I'm going to have to start working on both of those or at least one of them really quick here in order to get that learned because I have this role that I've done for a while, but I'm in Valencia and I don't know who the coach is who's going to be there, for example. But if there is somebody to work there with, that would be great. All of these like self-managing things I did not think about when I was definitely your age. And then sometimes I didn't think about them when I was already working because I, I, I thought like, oh, I can learn that in two weeks. But I definitely know that that's not the part of the process. There is working with your teacher, there's getting languages, and there's actually making sure that you know what's, what everybody on the stage is singing and saying and making sure that you have a character that you have a, a, a point of view about. Um, it's, a, it's a process to get to learn how to learn. And I feel like that's what I'm constantly, uh, it's, it's maybe a struggle, but it's also a fun journey, is like relearning how to learn something new. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Actually, I have like five, but I'm going to give others an opportunity to ask. My, um, what, part one is basically, what is, how important are vocalises you know, scales and, and those uh, essential elements in your, in learning music as you were, you know, acquiring your degrees. And then also, what is your performance, pre-performance routine? Like, you know, before you're gonna, you know, open a show or before you're going to present a recital, can you give us a little bit of uh, insight on what you do, on what each of you do for that? So I, I, like I said, I'm really an amateur singer, but I work all the time with singers. And I would say what is important about vocalises and other sorts of exercises it are the same things that are important about calisthenics for any other type of athletics. And what we are doing is basically small muscle athletics, right? And our instruments. Exercises would also include things like yoga, stretching out particularly your torso and shoulder and neck area, but also your hamstrings, because if your hamstrings are tight, your posture is not going to be as good as it could be. Um, I often assign vocalises to I would, what I would consider a mid-level singer, which is somebody who has some performance experience as a soloist, but is you know, not yet ready for the audition circuit. And the ones I tend to assign are the ones that are not in Concone, Marchese, Vakai, all of those. Because those tend to be based on major and minor scales and chords only. And the exercises that then we skip are the other harmonies. So I also recommend learning arpeggios that are based on diminished, dominant, half diminished, other types of chord clusters. If you are doing music that is non-tonal or, or extended tonality, definitely make vocalises out of the pitch cells that you're based on. I've been prepping a Britain opera with my students this last term, and it's based on a tritone plus a fourth on top or a tritone plus a fourth on the bottom. 
and we turned that bad boy into a vocalese like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. And it made a huge difference. And what that does is it teaches your mus sorry, it teaches your muscles how that feels. And not just your larynx, but, but all of the muscles involved. It also teaches that voice in your head that says, oh my God, this is hard. It teaches that voice, like, no, rather than to say this is hard, it says, this is what I have to do. Um, my pre-performance routine varies about who I'm collaborating with. I almost never perform as a soloist anymore. And so my pre-performance routine usually involves some sort of physical exercise to get my heart rate up, then some sort of meditation to just lower my energy level enough that I can be on stage and not be swinging wildly. Um, the right mix of caffeine and protein, and a chocolate for after. <laughs> this is actually so, it's so similar, the, the, the things that we're gonna say, and I'm gonna be embarrassed, because like, she said it better than I would have. I basically think that there's warming up, and then there's exercises, and then there's the repertoire. And somehow, I used to just go to doing the repertoire, and not really do the first two things, and I realized that the, the best thing that you can do for yourself is making sure that your warm-ups are easy, light, making sure your body, like Kristen said, you're the, your body is prepared to do bre breathing that is necessary to sing. And then your warm-ups are consistent with the things that you want to be doing well for the actual repertoire. For example, today I'm singing a Mozart aria that I know has two really difficult passages. You'll, you'll listen to them later and you'll tell me if they were okay. <laughs> but I, these two difficult coloratura passage, coloratura means fast moving notes, I have to actually prepare differently. So the, my warm ups for that, for, it, for tonight, in mind of those uh, two passages, are kind of geared to moving fast for, the, for, that, uh, for that piece. Of course, there's a lot of other repertoire. I have to sing this Russian, uh, this Russian aria at the end, so that I have a few warm ups that are kind of geared for that aria as well. Um, and of course, depending on the role, you know, that's, there's all sorts of roles that require different warm-ups as well. I say the best thing for pre-performance is to make sure that your body is, um, at, is at attention, but still relaxed, just like she said, and then I, l I love to have some sort of caffeine, <laughs> and because uh, I, I, I do think that it actually like, gives a little adrenaline to the, the performance either like too full of food, too uh, sore from either, you know, too much exercise or whatever, um, and that you're not too tired. Everything's at a balance. Yeah. Um, and then just piggybacking also on the warming up for what you're doing. I also find, because I do a lot of different kinds of playing and conducting and, and you know, based on who I'm collaborating with, um, you know, singers tend to have their, their fach, their category of music that fits their voice really well. But as a pianist, we have to do everything, depending on what our singers or instrumentalists want to be doing. So I tend to practice uh, based on a quote I got from the Canadian Brass, which was this amazing touring group, uh, Brass Quintet, that was one of my heroes when I was growing up. And when they asked the lead trumpet player, well, what do you practice when you're on the road for you know, 200, 300 concerts a year. And he said, I practice whatever I didn't play the night before. <laughs> so like tonight, we're doing Mozart, we're doing Handel, Poulenc, um, and opera, and Spanish. And so I'm also gonna be practicing things that, like, that there's nothing in, that we're doing tonight that requires me, for example, to play really big chords, like fistfuls of notes. So I should do a little bit of that tomorrow if I want my chops to be fluid. You know, and if I had been playing like a really big barn burner piano piece tonight, tomorrow I would want to practice something that was light or that, was, that had a really nice singing line or that had some like kind of uh, careful soft things or something. And, and we're doing some of that tonight. So I can check that off the box. I don't have to do that tomorrow, but you know, I might want to. <laughs> so that's also something to think about. Um, and like we've already talked about managing multiple projects at a time that, that have diff, you know, different deadlines that are approaching, but you wanna, you wanna just spin each of those plates a little bit every day or every other day. Um, you, you don't wanna pigeonhole your artistry so much into one project that you can't pivot to whatever the next thing that's coming. And so, you know, may, maybe, you know, if you, like you were saying, this, 
Mo these Mozart runs. Right. So you know, you, you look at them every so often, and then as it gets closer, you do it more and more and often. More and more. Right. I definitely I sang one role three times in a row. There was a couple of things in between, but I remember thinking I need to sing something completely different, even if it was I was it was Tamino in Magic Flute, and I remember thinking I need to sing something completely different, and so that's why I kind of got this Tito, and I tried to kind of put that in the repertoire, and it was way more difficult because I hadn't been singing that kind of repertoire with with coloratura. It's just a matter of like always bringing back, like she said, the plates. Always be having your the freshness about your voice. You have to constantly bring in, be bringing in repertoire warm ups exercises that actually incorporate the freshness. I also found I have found a lot of inspiration in reading um, autobiographies. And not necessarily of singers, although I love those as well, and they, they tend to be full of really good stories. Um, but um, I like I read a couple of books on long distance runners, and they talked about their training programs. And so, like training for a marathon, is a similar mindset to training for like a full operatic role mm -hmm. or a career. And and you know we we talk a lot about don't procrastinate, but if they procrastinate, you know then they don't get to taper off or whatever. And so I've learned a lot about reading about other other disciplines, also um, corporate leaders. As I've been doing more leadership um, as a conductor. You know, the ability to run a business is not dissimilar to the ability to stand in front of a group of musicians and lead them. And, and so th those types of things. Also, I sometimes I read a little bit before a concert, just even just a couple quotes or a passage in a book. I, I, in my Kindle, I have some things that are highlighted that will always come up. It's like, yeah, that's what I want to do tonight. Mm. So come, would yes. you come to the mic? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lawrence Davis. I am not quite in the realm of like singers uh, as you are. I'm actually a mariachi musician, but I have a few different questions. How would you, as a musician, balance performances between like experience and exposure, getting yourself out there, known to the world, versus monetary gain and keeping yourself stable just as a person in general? That's such a good question. Do yeah. you want to go first? That one? That was uh, one. That was one of oh three. Goodness. Okay. <laughs> Versi on the that. subject of versatility, would you recommend just going off the deep end, just going on as far as your mind can take you in terms of music, or just staying within your sphere of knowledge of the musical world? And on networking, you know, building connections, is it better to have several contacts, as just as many as you can, that aren't as solid, or fewer, just but runs deep, like you very well know the person. All right, which one? Um, well, uh, for me, the, the, actually your second and third questions are, are an easy answer. So I'm gonna, I'll tackle those first. Um, your third question about networking is both and, 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 and. I like to think about relationships in concentric circles. I tend to have two or three people at my absolute center. So whether that is a spouse, a bestie, a parent, whoever it is that you can call them, they're your ride or die, that you, you can call them at any hour and they will call you at any hour and they will tell you the hard things. You know, like honey, you've put on weight, you have got to deal with that or whatever it is. And you can take it from them. Um, the, the second question about creativity to me goes with the first question. Yeah. The more stable your life is, the easier it is to be creative around the outside. Um, and creativity in general is kind of, it's always this mix of creating and destroying, right? Because like if I'm gonna build a house, if I'm gonna create a house, I'm going to destroy piles of drywall and bags of concrete mix. So something is going to be destroyed. If your life has instability in it, your creativity is going to destroy your life on some level. And if you are stable and you have a, a really good base, whether that's financial support, friends, we talked about your circle of influence, th then your creativity will actually help you build your life. Mm -hmm. but, but if you are not attending to, and you mentioned like, is it better to use your creativity for exposure or to make money 
that, that's, that's a, a, an important question for your whole life. Yeah. So um, the, I, I always recommend, though, that people go as far out on the cliff as you can. Nine and a half toes over the cliff. Just mm -hmm. enough that you don't you know, face plant. And then you can always decide if you like it out there. And if you like it out there, then you know, build yourself a trellis so you can hang there. <laughs> So I think the, the three questions all kind of mix together in that you're talking about who do you trust, and then you're talking about how much, um, how much risk do you take as far as the versatility and the, the, the jobs. And then you're saying, uh, I'm sorry, as far as the job, money versus your passion. Right, your passion. Um, and then the other one was what? The other one was like, oh, versatility, right? I feel like if you have, um, again, like this house example is good. I think if you have a really good core team of people that you do trust, that you know are, uh, are uh, genuine about uh, their care for you, that should include your, you know, your voice teacher, your coaches, your family. You should have some, some chosen family also that is very like, close enough to you that you, that you want um, that help. They will guide you and also your value system is kind of based around uh, that as well. And your values really kind of show you what that balance between monetary need and just living and that passion that you really want. Um, and then, the, and then like far from that, the creativity and the versatility can be like the, the cherry on top basically. I mean, like, if you have a, uh, if you have really great uh, encouragement about the fact that there is going to be opportunity and that there will be jobs and that there are things for you in the future, then you're going to be encouraged to continue with your degree, to continue seeking the opportunity, to create your own opportunities, and then from that, then you can play. Then you get to be versatile. Then you get to work on other instruments. Then you get to try out different ensembles and things. Um, but really what stems from that is that value system of the things and the people especially that are around you. Um, and I really, I, I hope that that makes sense. <laughs> and I, I, hope, I hope for everybody here that you also have that team of people that, you know, I called it a team. There's a circle of influence. There's the, really your, your family that can help you out with that too. There's also this really cool thing about being a creative person being a creative thinker and actually studying a creative discipline, which means we learn those creative skills and we can then take them and apply them to any area of our life that we want. And so we, I, I think musicians often have an advantage in terms of making a structure for your life because we're already used to thinking outside the box in terms of our performing. So the way, and I, I, I use the word stable because that's the word I use for myself when I'm ever, I'm questioning like, is this gonna be, is this going to increase my stability or is it going to be, be, be like you use the word risk. Mm -hmm. And um, the opportunity to reimagine what we're doing is so vital because if you are doing the same thing over and over again at a certain point, that will also not be as rewarding or it could be, if you choose to change your thinking about it, it could be, you know what, I know exactly what to do in these seven areas of my life, which means these over here are free for me to play. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, the, your mindset and the way that you choose to think about things can also then either ma make concrete decisions or help you free up yeah, energy for other things. Yeah. Yes. Come on on. You can just say it loud. We'll repeat it for you. Uh, okay. um, how do you balance life? Um, how do you balance work life and your personal life? Good question. How do you balance your work life and your personal life? Well, I'm still learning how to do that. <laughs> no, I think that's uh, that's actually a journey. You know, everybody has their own journey. Um, to get really personal, I I grew up in a very Baptist home. I loved making music in church. I uh, came out when I was 30 years old, and then I got married to my husband when I was 35 years old, and my music has never felt so um, personal 
until after m like making sure that that is really a part of my life. And um, my music feels so, uh, when I get to collaborate and create, I feel so, um, I feel like I can sing m like more genuinely about love and about relationships because I feel like that's something that I needed to, to break through. Whereas before I felt like a student, I was doing this thing that was prescribed and that I had heard somebody sing it like this and this is the way I was gonna sing about love. And I do feel now, and we talked a lot about this in the car on the way here, I feel like now that we're, we have more of an opportunity to choose repertoire that we, get, that we can actually relate to, that'll show our story and tell our, talk about our identity a little more. And really from COVID, so many things have changed also. I think that COVID is a big part about the personal life changing a lot and how musicians and artists are having to be a part of connecting with people and making sure that we know and appreciate that there are levels of safety and health, obviously. There's levels of respect and representation that are necessary. There's stories that need to be told of, of, other, uh, of other people that, aren't in, that maybe aren't like us, and we need to actually like, be able to uh, see them and be able to tell them too. Um, and I, I think that during COVID, now that we're kind of coming back into being together, we can appreciate those connections more and we can hear those stories and appreciate them so much more. For me, any kind of balance always begins with gratitude. Because if I am really grateful for exactly where I happen to be at this moment, then it's also easier for me to see I'm grateful because of, I, I'm on stage with David, I'm grateful because you all are taking time out of your day to just dialogue with us and chat with us. And I'm grateful because I know there's at least three people watching the live stream that I know about, so that's awesome too. Um, and, and two of them texted me to tell me that they were gonna be there. So. Um, and just by saying those three things, I felt a shift in my energy level, and maybe you all heard it when I was talking just now. So if I start with that, any decision I make after that will be a much better decision. And, and that's something, again, we talk about things that we had to learn. I had to learn that because for a long time, I rolled out of bed and I was just like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do today and I went to bed too late, which means that I'm getting up too early and the coffee is not kicking in enough. And you can just tell what happened to my voice when I was talking like that. And I'm, I'm not even doing it on purpose. <laughs> so the, for me, gratitude is what also expands my awareness of what's possible, which also then enables me to handle a lot more stress and or a lot more joy, because joy can be equally exhausting, even as awesome as it is. Um, so I when like, I, go ahead. I like that you said balance with it too, because it does create a sense of balance. And really to make, create art, we have to be, and, and to, to make music, I feel like you have to find the, the things that are um, the, the, the two ends of the spectrum, because music is incredibly emotional but it's also very objective. And we talk about rhythms and pitches and, and making sure everything is very specific. Opera, for example, is incredibly historic and educational as well as being really entertaining and goofy and fun and, you know, and, and so passionate. So finding a balance between all of that also on our, in our personal lives is the same thing. It's that really hard work, getting in a practice room and figuring out something technically with your voice and also being up there and being free. And that's, that balance is always gonna go back and forth. And you're gonna feel like, you're gonna feel like a crazy person sometimes, but it's actually really freeing when you can find like that middle ground, when you just start coasting and you have your muscle memory going and you are collaborating and, and you're actually able to enjoy the moment. I love the, and if you saw David's hands just now, he described balance as a state of motion right? That balance is actually not solid. Even our biggest, what we would think of as like our big sculpture, the Statue of Liberty, it's drilled full of holes because that way the wind can move through it and it can move. And so I, I find that I feel or I perceive the most balance when I am fluidly moving between a variety of things. 
Um, any of you who go to the gym, you know what a balance board looks like, and you are never actually still on that thing. You know, it's always just a slight variation of your body weight um, or on a BOSU ball or something like that. Um, and, and so the, whenever there's something in our life that's stuck, that is by nature not a state of balance or a state of flow. So I would equate balance to flow. Mm -hmm. If I find that something in my life is stuck and gratitude doesn't take care of it, then I look for a place to give. And whether that's give of my time, give a tithe of my money, reach out to, to one of my children and give them a hug or, like, or a colleague or something. But if gratitude and giving don't take care of it, then I go for a really big bit of exercise. So those are the three things I use for flow. Mm -hmm. oh. Hi. Hello. I love um, your mask. With, thank you. <laughs> with the amount of repertoire and uh, you've performed in your career, how are you able to go about keeping the music not only interesting for the audience, but for yourself, and not just staying and going through the motions of music and being able to actually perform it the way the composer intended it? That's good. That's good. I mean, I feel like every time, every time I perform, we were talking about getting nervous. And everybody has different ideas about what nerves are, whether it's adrenaline or whether it's actual fear. <laughs> uh, and sometimes that actually, that, that's something that comes along. But I feel like the freshness of uh, a performance is that feeling of, oh my gosh, I care so much. I care to share this with people. I care because I'm really grateful for this and I wanna, I wanna do it well. I wanna do well by these people who are here. I want to show my teacher that I've worked on this. I care about it. And I think that, um, that not every time I sang was I very caring. But definitely in the last few years, I've de I mean, after COVID especially, every time just feels like this wonderful new gift because we get to do this. And we're, you know, like, we didn't get to do it for so long and it was really sad and it takes you to that p place where it's where that's all you want to do is you want to get in front of people and share and um i do think that the the I, the portion about either whether it's nerves or whether it's um oh i'm maybe um not as prepared or oh maybe there's something i'm worried about is always going to be nervousness because i care to do well by this and that causes a freshness every single time. And whether it is something that I've sung a million times, uh, maybe that's a little harder to care, but I've never sung anything a million times, so I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every time is, is new. It's either new people to sing with, and, and it's definitely a new audience. So I care by that. I usually care to, to sing for that audience. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. I, my teacher was used to say, just play beautifully. Just play beautifully. And so I, I try to, I do better if I keep things simple for myself. And um, her point usually when she said that was don't worry about like getting it perfect. Don't worry about the reviewer in the audience. Don't worry about the composer's ghost who's listening to you play and asking if you got it right. Um, but just play beautifully. And, and if, if it's beautiful, chances are it's gonna touch somebody. Um, I'm, all, I'm also reminded of there was a speech that was given at, I don't, I don't know what school it is, but it, it, it circular, circulates around the internet. Um, it, was, it was given to a group of music students who, who, and it was like a graduation speech or something. And, and basically the gist of it was when you wonder if it matters what you do today or if, it wonder, if you wonder if it matters or how to do your performance, just remember that there might be a brain surgeon in the audience who is coming for their inspiration and what they take away from your performance is gonna help them the next time they're saving someone's life. And so, you know, or I, I know I've had the experience of having somebody in the audience who then said to me, I was really feeling terrible and I, I've been having a really rough time in my life and your, your music made a difference. 
and and you know we don't always get to hear that directly from the audience sometimes we just we really hope that that's what's happening um, but I, I like to try to think about it's really not about me it's about the music and it's about the music reaching anybody who's out there or out there <laughs> in the camera um, and that that has also helped me with my own performance anxiety and also we were talking about my personally my anxiety is not in the performance my anxiety is when I have to go practice on a day I don't feel like it um, it's like I really don't want to sound bad first before I start sounding good um, but if I could get past that anxiety then by the time I get to the performance then then I also know that I'm free I'm free to send my own love and care um, out to all of you These are really great questions, and it's so. So we talked about this being a Q and A for just a few people today, and saying uh, what it is that we wanted to get from this as well. And I feel like having to think through these things that are y'all y'all's questions are way better than like, you know, who is your accountant? Like those kind of those kind mm -hmm. of adult questions are so different. Meeting that synergy of here is my passion and what I love and what objectively do I need to know to feel better about pursuing that passion and we need to be reminded about pursuing the passion too and have that same like excitement and spark so I really appreciate y'all being here and asking questions yeah and, really and it's it's just as moving for us to to get to meet you and I mean it's it's always a little weird like you know we're what three feet higher and, and yeah. sitting in these chairs and under <laughs> the light lighting and, <laughs> but I mean, at, at a certain point, we're all just artists. We're all just musicians. We we really all do the same thing. Um, we we are doing this specific, and we're saying some specific words now. But but we we are taking as much away from this afternoon as anybody in the room. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, you can, we say can it. repeat it. Yeah. Oh, this is a great question. Um, all of us that are performers end up as teachers and leaders at some point. And whether that's as a conductor of an ensemble, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, like putting together an ensemble, or as, as a soloist or as a chamber musician, I have often been invited to attend parties with donors or board members or select audience members. And they, they ask the exact same questions, like how do you do that? How do you get that? And the, there's really two things that you need. You need something that will galvanize the group. And if it's not, the music in specific that you're doing, which is, I think I understood your question that this is new music or a new style or whatever. There is something that everybody has in common. And when in doubt, try humor. <laughs> because we all love to laugh. If, if you can't make a laugh, then try food. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone <laughs> likes to eat. Um, but if you whatever when you can find that thing and you will feel the energy in the room change when everyone is like oh my gosh that was so wonderful let me tell you about the taco that I had <laughs> um, then you've got a group then the next thing is your passion and your ability to explain why it is and how it is that you do it and you all asked us how we practice how we warm up how we do the um, that's actually, as a conductor, that's what, what I think is one of the most fun things, is getting to introduce uh, you know, how and why. And I, I spend a lot of time actually teaching people their very first operatic experience, whether that's in the classroom or in a cast, um, whether uh, you know, maybe in an opera chorus or maybe they're singing a small role for the first time, or maybe they've had a lot of experience in musical theater, but they're singing legit theater or they're singing opera, for the, or they're singing in a foreign language for the first time. So I actually get to do this a lot. So these are the tools I use. Humor, food, and then my own, my own process. This is how I do it. I translate, I did it, you know, whatever, the, the whole process for how I learn the thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't taught in a, in a classroom in very many years, but I remember that my, the most amazing thing that I remember from my student teaching was that music is all play. 
because kids don't want to know that they're learning music. They just want to play a game that has a melody with it. And if you walk in a circle and you have to all stop at the same time and there's music going on that they're learning the words to, that's a game that's more fun. And I feel like what we, what we do at first when we're sitting in choir for the first time is all fun. And it's all, it's nothing about it is, is um, supposed to make you nervous or is supposed to be too, too much, you're not supposed to put too much thought into it. And I feel like anybody who you're trying to encourage in a new ensemble and a new style of music and a new instrument, whatever it is, you have to make it fun and make play of it right at the beginning. And I feel like when we get to thinking about opera and ooh, you have to do all the scary stuff and do your warm ups and everything, this is like still there has to be a little bit of play. And that also means like smiling every once in a while. <laughs> that means or all the time. All the time, yeah. Having humor, uh, you know, at, like connecting with people uh, over different things. If, you know, let's ask them about their cat rather than, um, you know, talk about the next, uh, your next rehearsal or whatever. Well, that's, you know, if anybody's ever taught a little kid how to use their head voice, what do you use? You use a flashlight on the wall, you go, woo, and they all, you, know, you make them follow, or you use like, can you sound like an owl? Or, you know, so the, none of us really lose that childlike part of ourselves. And um, n none of us can tolerate being an adult for very long yeah. at one time. Yeah. So don't be afraid to, don't be afraid not to be serious and think that, that you have to be serious all the time because we, we can actually work very hard while we're being very stupid at the same time. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, yeah, totally. Yeah, well, especially at the beginning. And, and the, while you're laying out the whatever, the, I was about to use the word ground rules, but it's not even rules. It's just <laughs> like, it's like, this is what we do here. Yeah. And, So all the time. <laughs> I, like, I, it's more like, has there ever been a performance when there isn't something unexpected that happens? Yeah. Okay, I have two. I have a scary one, and then I have a funny one. So I was in the Meistersinger, uh, Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg at the Lyric Opera Chicago, and there was, it's a beautiful production, and it came from England, and everybody was so excited about it. And there were stilt walkers who were also fire breathers, which I don't understand where they thought this was normal, but the this, this fire breather has to have this canister of this oil liquid stuff and then the, the torch in one hand, and then they were on stilts, right? So all of this had to be like very carefully timed out. The guy goes out there, this is the final dress rehearsal, for, so there's like a lot of people in the audience. And um, the guy, like he does his first, he does his first blowout and then the, the fire goes out, but then a little bit stays on this mask. He's wearing this full head mask. And a little bit stays on the mask, and then um, he kind of like shakes it off and thinks it's gone, and then drinks some more. And when that happens, the fire comes up, and there's like, there's oh, now this, this liquid has all this fire on it. And so he just had to fall to the ground. He's okay, everybody's okay. But that was like a really like, ah, kind of scary one. Um, a funny one, I don't know if that was an appropriate one to say, but if you look it up, Lyric Opera of Chicago, it's, there's pictures online. So um, the, the, then the funny one was I was in my first real opera professionally was at El Paso Opera, and I was doing my master's um, in North Texas, and they let me go do this, this show. Um, it was Tosca, and I, um, the director was Carol Freeman. You remember Carol yeah, Freeman? Yeah. And he was, he wanted Spoletta at the very end, Cavaradossi dies a second time. And he wanted Spoletta to come up and take the gun from one of the, one of the guys who are, has already shot him and reshoot the Cavaradossi who's on the floor. And this is like a weird, like it, it was a weird idea. Well, the thing is the guy who was supposed to have his gun in the holster that show just didn't have anything. And so I was like, oh, in the moment, I like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. 
So then at the end, I ended up just going over to the, to the soldier's shoulder and just crying on his shoulder because I thought that that was going to be more appropriate, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and then y you could actually see the Cavaradossi like, look up at me and be like, <laughs> what's happening? Because <laughs> he was supposed to die a second time. Anyway, so that was, that was one of the embarrassing parts <laughs> that I just ended up crying at the end of the show for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, those of us that are pianists who play with collaborators who are performing from memory, we, we have infinite numbers of stories of having to find the place in the music that our singer or instrumentalist has skipped to. So I have a bunch of those. And now that I use my iPad quite a bit, it usually involves like tapping a lot. <laughs> um, the, but bef like before iPads, I would you know lay out the music and the, there was one performance uh, of a beautiful song, but it had a lot of just sort of rolling arpeggios in the accompaniment and not something that I wanted to disturb to reach up and turn a page. And so I had a lot of pages, but apparently the, the music rack of the piano was not about that. And in the middle, I was playing this really sort of tender arpeggio and it flopped down with this big thunk. And the, so then I had to like stand up and kind of do this. And as I did that, the, the brakes of the piano were also not set properly, oh, so the no. piano started to wander. So I turned into Victor Borga, <laughs> chasing the piano all over the stage. Oh, so um, there's, not, there's, there's all kinds of unexpected things mm -hmm. that happen in live performance. And this is also where if you are, if you really are prepared yourself, and if, you're, if you have taken care of yourself, not just your performing, but you are in a state where you, you, your mind is both at the present moment and also just a little bit ahead so that you know what's coming. As a conductor, I often have to be hours ahead because I have to you know, make sure that we all get to the end of the show at the same time. But, but if you're in a good place, you, you will handle those things. And we actually were talking there about a previous performance we did together and Dave was like, do you remember when such and such happens? And I'm like, actually, no. Like, I don't remember that at all. That, that really happened in this performance? And, it, it had just left, and and I'm sure it was because we were we were right there, and you know, not it all it, it, it just all okay, kind of ended up yeah. fine, and yeah. and it didn't make even an impression on me. So, yeah, yeah there, there's always something. I mean, we, I've seen wardrobe malfunctions. I've seen people, you know, display parts of their body on stage that no audience member should ever see. I I've one seen, time yeah. hit a, a hit a prop into the pit at, at the Met. Did, did you get it back? Did they throw it back? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I was mortified and I stopped singing. It was just a rehearsal, but that, that happened. But in a performance at the Met, I kicked a pillow into the pit <laughs> and it landed like right where the guitarist was. So then there was an empty space, so it didn't like land on an instrument. Um, what else in the pit? I think that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen like special effects go wrong. I've seen scenery be put in the wrong place. And so people, you know, think there's going to be a chair there, and it's actually on the wrong side of the stage. I mean, we've seen people miss entrances. A and medical emergency one time in Munich that I was singing my aria, and I saw the intendant on the side, and he was going like this. And so I just, like, kept singing, and then the aria ended, and I just walked off stage. <laughs> <laughs> and so we stopped for, like, 10 minutes. Well, I was telling this story last night. My, uh, when I was in the Merrill program, which is a training program at the San Francisco Opera, we were doing an outdoor performance in the park. Uh, for about 40,000 people had attended this performance. And of course, everybody's mic'd. And in the middle of the, my job was to sit with the sound engineer and let them know which characters were making entrances and exits so they knew which mics to unmute. And in the middle of the act one finale, all of a sudden you could not properly hear certain people on the stage. So of course, the, the sound director is, you know, frantically looking and, and also cursing and say like, oh, I changed all the batteries in the mic pack and why is this happening? And it turns out there was actually, uh, this was right as cell phones were just being invented. And there was a man having a heart attack and they were trying to radio the ambulance to come to the park and the, the signals were interfering with each other. And so of course, then our conversation and intermission turned from, what happened to the microphones and this can never happen again to, oh my gosh, is he all right? Is this guy okay? Is he okay? And, and, and it turned out he was fine. I mean, it was a, an emergency, but they did get the, the ambulance. And yeah. um, 
Yeah. It's, it's actually like super fun to see what's going to happen if there's, I mean, not, not medical emergencies, but it's on stage, you're always having to deal with what's coming up next. And that's actually kind of, there's, there's something that's always like, ooh, is somebody going to try and make me laugh? Am I going to try and make somebody laugh? What's going to happen? Yeah, if you all go on YouTube and look for interviews with Judy Dench, Judy Dench is famous for trying to send up her colleagues. So, um, <laughs> A very serious. Yeah. Well, also, you know, opera often is about holding the high notes, right? So we have a colleague, Christine Gerke, who's the leading dramatic soprano of our generation. And she was just doing a series of Turandot performances at the Met. And, and her final performance, she posted on social, social media this hilarious account of the big high note in her duet with the tenor, because all of a sudden, he had decided to hold it an extra long time that <laughs> night. And she was like, I'm out. I, I cannot make that. But, but um, you know, she said it in a very laughing way. So those kinds of things happen all the time, too. Or, mm -hmm. you know, he was clearly having a really good night, and that high C was just going to go on a little bit longer. Yeah, find the joy. That's, that's the fun part. Yeah, there's also there's a whole line of careers called Jumping In, where, um, it, and it's, it's more in Europe than it is here, but it definitely happens here where someone is ill. And I mean, I've, I've had jump-ins in the pit in, in orchestras I was conducting. I had a, we were doing a performance of Johnny Skiki, and I had uh, the keyboard player and the principal flute were in a car accident on the way to the theater. And they, it was not serious, but it was serious enough that they went to the emergency room instead of to the performance. And so we actually, there was a, one of my piano colleagues was in the audience, and I was like, you're sight reading the part, come on. And then the second flute bumped up to principal, and the, it was actually, there was another piece that had another flute player, and she just happened to be there. So it's like, good, the second player is playing principal, and let's introduce the second. And then I saw all the woodwind section just galvanize around those two new players and be like, okay, look, let's look at rehearsal 75. Let's play this. Oh, and this is in, and this is in G flat. Would you please mark all the flats? Hmm. And, you know, that, that was the five minutes before um, the show started. Hmm. And, you know, and it was, it was great, and we all gave them a big hand. Yeah after they jumped in. I, I definitely have done a lot of covering, which is understudying. And uh, I was at the Lyric Opera Chicago as a young artist, and so I feel like I covered all the time. And I probably went on at least a dozen times for things that I was only covering. And I, I, I think it's great when, they, when you're able to come in and kind of save the day. So that's also another time when it seems terrifying, but it's actually like really fulfilling because you get to really learn the role and you get to have a chance to do it, and it's, it, it's been fun. A lot of important musicians have gotten their careers started by jumping in. You know, Leonard Bernstein got his conducting career started by jumping in to conduct the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. Lot and lots of important performers. So you just never know. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you. For thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Let's, let's Great. Thank you all. Thank you.